Okay, welcome to this video on relative velocity. So this is a topic that should have been covered earlier in the year, but it wasn't, so we're going to do it now. And I'm going to do a very quick overview of it. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but you should know what it is and what the terms mean uh, when you're trying to answer questions, particularly multiple choice questions, because they love to give these with vectors. So the relative velocity of an object is the velocity that's dependent upon a frame of reference. So the, the, the velocity of a particle depends upon the reference frame of whoever is observing or measuring the velocity. So a reference frame is what are you anchoring that velocity to? What are you referring to that velocity from? Are you referring to it from the ground? Are you referring to it from a car? Are you referring to it from the water? Are you referring to it from the wind? Uh, all of these things matter. And pilots know this very well because you have your relative speed to the ground, which might be very different than the rel relative speed to the wind. If you're flying into the jet stream or, or with the jet stream, the speed of the plane is going to drastically change because you have to add those up. So a frame of reference is, a reference frame is the, the physical object to which we attach our coordinate system, usually the ground. Uh, so we have to say that we're moving at a certain speed in reference to something else. Otherwise, we don't really know that we're moving. So typically, when we have a problem, like a one-dimensional kinematics problem, we typically do it without a reference point. So when we, when we saw this before, if I had two different cars moving towards each other here, let's say I have car A here, and then I'm going to have car B over here, that these two objects moving towards each other, we said when we talk about uh, vectors, we said that the velocity of A is 10 meters per second and the velocity of B is negative 5 meters per second, let's just say. And if we did this correctly, that the arrow of B should be half the size of the arrow of A visually, just to represent that, so hopefully that's about twice the size. But that's how we did it before. Now we have to define points that we're going to uh, take our frame of reference from. So what I like to do is I like to put the letter G on the ground and use that as my anchor point, typically when we're talking about kinematics problems of vehicles moving on the road. If there's water, we might put W for water, or wind, we might put W for wind. But we can also define the velocity of A in terms of B, which we're going to do in a minute. So. But typically, this is just how we start. So this is what's been missing before. We didn't show the G before, but now we're going to show it. This is the terminology here. So this is really, really important. The order of these letters matters. So you say the velocity of A with respect to G is written like this. In other words, A comes before G. So the velocity of A with respect to the ground is written in this fashion. If I flip those letters, it means something different. So if I flip that, it would mean the velocity of the ground with respect to A. So that's very as a very different statement if I flip the order of those. This one is the velocity of B with respect to the ground. Same concept, except this one's moving in the opposite direction there. I just talked about that the velocity of A with respect to G is not the same as the velocity of G with respect to A, but there is a relationship. In fact, they're actually the opposite of each other. So uh, if I put a negative here, that's telling me that they're actually in opposite directions. What does that mean? Well, in a one-dimensional example, that just means you flip the sign. In this case right here, the velocity of A with respect to G, that's positive 10. And the velocity of G with respect to A, that's negative 10. And so it might, you might just look at that and say, well, that's pretty easy. I don't need to, why are we doing all of this notation if I just have to flip the sign? The reason is that if you are dealing with vectors, you have to flip the vector. So for example, if I go here with the velocity of A with respect to B, let's just say that it looks like this, the velocity of A with respect to B, then the velocity of B with respect to A, if I flipped it, would actually look like this. So it really matters when we're talking about the components. And when you flip these vectors, and when we're talking about unit vector notation, you have to flip every sign of the components. 
So that's the key with that. So in this case, we just flip the sign here because it's 1D. But if I was dealing with components, I would have to flip the X and the Y in unit vector notation to get that flip vector. So just something to consider. When we're talking about B with respect to the ground, it's the same as negative ground with respect to B. So again, that's just restating what I showed up there. If I looked at this in unit vector notation, just to show you, again, velocity of B with respect to G, uh, the unit vector notation here, if we're talking just on the X, is negative 5 and 0, right? Now, all, what I would really do here, if I flip these two, I'm going to flip every sign. So I'm just going to go plus 5 here, and then, of course, 0 doesn't have a sign. So it's still just 0. But if the velocity of b with respect to the ground was negative 5 and, and 2, then the velocity of the ground with respect to b would be 5 comma negative 2. So that's really where it gets important here, because uh, in the two-dimensional cases, it gets rather complicated. Uh, I don't think you're going to see too many complicated questions on this on the AP, but I just want to point this out. Now, there's a central doctrine here uh, to find these one term with respect to the other. Here's how this goes. I want to find the velocity of A with respect to B. In other words, I want to find out those two cars are coming towards each other. I want to find out what is the velocity of both of them as they're coming towards each other, as they see each other. Here's what it is. The velocity of A with respect to the ground here is you have to add that to the velocity of the ground with respect to B. And so the whole point of this is that on the inside, these inner terms here, they're going to cancel out. So you see the G and the G here, that's going to cancel out. So they're just going to merge to become they're going to merge to become the velocity of A with respect to B. So in other words, these two terms here are going to merge to become the velocity of A with respect to B. So that's vectorially. So as long as you line these two inner terms up, you're fine. It's, it's relatively straightforward. But the, the key is understanding is that I had A with respect to the ground and B with respect to the ground. But now I have to flip it. Right? I have to flip it to get the ground with respect to B. And so to get the ground with respect to B, um, remember i got to flip all the components. And then in that case, that's how you'll get that relative velocity of A with respect to B. Let's look at that as an example. In this case, it's a one-dimensional case. And one-dimensional is relatively simple. No pun intended. Relatively simple. Relative velocity. Velocity of A to G, G to B here. So we flip the sign here from negative 5 to 5. We just talked about that. And I'll just I'll write it out again here. The, the velocity of B with respect to the ground uh, was negative 5 comma 0. And so the velocity of the ground with respect to B is just going to be 5 comma 0. So you add these up and you get 15 meters per second. So what does that mean? That means that if you take the frame of reference of this car coming, car B coming towards you, towards car A, that it's as if car A is moving 15 meters per second towards B. So if B was stationary, it would be acting as if it's moving 15 meters per second towards it. And so that's why in cars, head-on head -on collisions are much worse than rear-end collisions, because rear-end, they could both be moving forward. Front-end, you have to take into account the relative velocities, too. And this is how a Doppler radar works on a police car. The Doppler radar sends out a radar, and then that radar reflects back to the cop, and it's able they're able to take the difference of the frequencies, and they're able to tell how fast that car is moving towards them. So we don't cover Doppler in this topic, but that's it, it's using the same concept there when you get that reflection back from the frequencies. Okay, so what about two-dimensional case? So let's do, I'm going to do a simple case here. This is just X and Y and straight components, but it, this could be, you know, strange-looking vectors, too. It doesn't have to be so straightforward like this. But in this case, a boat is crossing a river, a river north. Uh, the boat moves at a speed of 10 meters per second with respect to the water. The river has a cross current of 5 meters per second east with respect to the ground. What is the velocity of the boat with respect to the ground? Okay, so the boat moves at a speed of... 10 meters per second with respect to the water. Okay, this is the boat. So that's the velocity of the boat 
with respect to the water. And the river has a cross current of 5 meters per second with respect to the ground. So the velocity of the water, which we'll call it with respect to the ground, is going to be 5. So the velocity of the water with respect to the ground is going to be 5. Okay, so that's just deciphering that word problem right there. So we get on here. Here's my diagram. Now I have my two different frames of reference, so I'm going to label these. The first one is going to be the ground, G here, and the next one is going to be the water, W here. The velocity of the boat with respect to the water. In other words, this boat is going north. We talked about that, north at 10 meters per second with respect to the water. But what's going to happen? The, 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 current, the current is going to push the boat this way. So that boat's going to start drifting sideways. So the velocity of the boat's actually going to be going off somewhere in this direction. So it's going to be trying to go straight, but it's going to be going this way. And you can see this with airplanes too. When they're landing, a lot of times if there's like a cross breeze, you'll see airplanes like flying sideways. Like if you're looking at an airplane, up in the sky, like if you're here, and there's an airplane flying above, up up here. Pretend like that's an airplane, okay? There's my airplane. That sometimes you'll actually see it, instead of flying straight like this, you'll see it kind of like drifting sideways as it's flying over you. Especially if you're near like a small airport, you see those little Cessnas coming in, they're kind of like drifting sideways because of this wind profile that goes on. And that's why when airplanes land, uh, the worst thing you can have is what's called a crosswind. Uh, so when the wind is blowing across the plane, that is like the absolute worst thing that you could possibly want at an airport because it's gonna it's it, it's it's not doing anything but destabilizing the plane. When you have a plane landing on an airport, uh, typically what you want, and you'll see this, most runways will face in the direction of the predominant wind. So in Miami, what happens is we have a predominantly east wind like this, and so these airplanes are coming in. And so what you always want is you always want the plane taking off and landing into the wind. So if you have an airplane here that's taking off, you want that wind to be coming into the plane because what it does is it creates uh, more lift because if the, the velocity of the plane, let's say that the velocity of the plane is, uh, let's just say 90 miles per hour, let's say it's taking off 90, and let's say that that east wind is at 20, uh, miles per hour, then what you're going to essentially have is, is, a, is a relative velocity of, on that plane of 110 miles per hour. So that creates more lift, so that's good when it's taking off, it's good when it's landing, and the exact opposite is true. You never want to never want a tailwind because that can cause a plane to drop like a rock, or you don't want a crosswind. I don't want that wind blowing across the plane like this. So that's why when you go to airports, they always study the the climate of the area and they look for the predominant direction of the wind and in, in Miami it's always coming from the east because it's 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 the ocean now we do get north and northwest winds with cold fronts that come through and and all of that in the winter but predominantly we're going to get a east to southeast flow so you're going to see these runways flow in this direction occasionally occasionally if you go to the airport on a cold day what you will see is you'll actually see the planes and you'll actually see them taking off into the west when you get a cold front. So when those cold fronts come through, I don't know if we're going to have any more this year, but when you get a west, when a strong west wind, you'll actually see the direction of the planes change. So instead of taking off towards the water, they'll actually take off towards the Everglades because of that reason, because they always want that, that relative velocity to be as high as possible to create that lift. Uh, other things come into play too, like temperature. Like when you have colder days, it's easier for planes to take off because the air is denser. There's some places like in Arizona that when it gets so hot, the air becomes so so thin that the airplanes can't take off. They can't they can't get enough lift. So, but we don't have that problem here in Miami as much. The main thing is just that get that direction right into into the wind. So that's just an example of crosswind. And, and then one more example is that I talked about before. If you have United States here and Mexico and Baja Key West and Cuba and Haiti that you have this uh, the jet stream flows across the United States you get this this flow this is called zonal flow when it flows from west to east but you get these really really high velocities and they can get up to 
over 100 miles per hour. And so these airplanes, when they fly uh, from one direction to the other, in this case, they have to fly against the jet stream. They have to burn a lot more fuel to keep the speed. And in this case, they get these tailwinds and they can fly much easier from west to east. So it just depends on where that jet stream is. But when they get up there, they can save fuel on this side and they burn more fuel on this side. And so this is why air, airplanes also give you a big lag time. Like they can actually get there much faster than they need to. And they purposely go slower for reasons like this to keep this, the, the trips relatively close. And then there's also economy of fuel that they want to fly at the, just the right speed for the economy of the fuel. But again, this is relative velocity into effect. And the same would happen if you flew this way, you'd be drifting off this way. Uh, same thing can be true for anybody who's who's a fisherman out in the water. If you go on the boat, there's there's this this Gulf Stream comes up. It pushes. There's a current that flows up, and it's it's not that much. It's like two to three knots. If you're out fishing in the water, you could be going this way towards the Bahamas. And I've I've done this before. I've been in fishing boats like this. We're out just driving east. The the, the compass says we're driving east. Everything's fine. We're driving east, and then five hours later, we're in Fort Lauderdale because it's pushing you up. So the Gulf Stream will carry you up very quickly uh, if you're not using a GPS. If you're using just a regular compass and you think you're going east, you're not going east. You're going northeast. So just something to consider there. So those are just some real-life examples. Now back to our example here. So I have the ground. I have the water at the velocity of the boat with respect to the water and the velocity of the water with respect to the ground. In this case, it was already set up for us like perfectly. So if I want to find the velocity of the boat with respect to the ground, how is the boat, like if there's a person out here watching you, watching your boat, what are they going to see? They are going to see your boat drifting off this way. It's going to be drifting off this way. They're not going to see it this way. So the, so the velocity of the boat with respect to the ground is the velocity of the boat with respect to the water plus the velocity of the water with respect to the ground. Now, in this case, they're already lined up perfectly. You didn't have to flip anything. Okay, so I'm just going to write these out in the univector notation. So the velocity of the boat with respect to the water is going to be 0, 10. So the velocity of the boat with respect to the water is just going straight due north. In this case, I made my y coordinate the north. And then the... the the east is going to be the x, so I make the x and y just to clarify. And the velocity of the water with respect to the ground is going to be 5, 0. And so when you add these up, you get 5, 10. You're just adding those components up, so you're actually going to get 11.18 meters per second. So you're actually going to be going faster than your speed here uh, because you have to include the the water speed and then you're going to take inverse tangent of 10 over 5 which is 63.43 north of east so the theta that I'm taking right here that's what I found because when I take inverse tangent of y over x remember that's in reference to the x axis right here 11.18 meters per second 63.43 north of east if you ever see a question about this there's lots of trick questions they can ask you the time that it takes to get across here is dependent upon the boat's speed. It has nothing to do with the river, unless the river's going against the head of the boat. But So in essence, the time that it takes the boat to get from here to here, if there's no current, is the same as the time it takes the boat to get from here to here if there is a current. Because the component that's responsible for getting the boat across is just this component here. I hope that makes sense. That if you ever see that question, if I'm asking how long it takes to get across, it has nothing to do with this. It has to do only with this. So even though I'm going to travel further this way, I'm still going to get to the side on point A and point B. I'm still going to get there at the same exact time. Okay, so if there's ever a question that asks you that, that they get there at the same time. So just something I would throw in there at the end. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you soon.